Well, I'm delighted to see you today. I'm glad you're here, and ready to worship and ready to study God's Word. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13, please. Matthew 13 this morning. There's not going to be a PowerPoint. I have a very spiritual reason for that. I didn't do it. So, Matthew 13, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. When you find them, please stand to your feet. And the Word of God says this, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has... To him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Father, please teach us your word today. Give me the ability to articulate this message. We thank you in Jesus' righteous and holy name. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to begin a new series today. And we're going to be studying these parables of the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, to do all of this, what we're going to concentrate on are these parables in Matthew 13. And so many times that I've read these parables, I've wondered maybe what the Lord was trying to teach us. I've heard good men, in fact, and Dr. Berger, I know you did, and Nick, when you were in seminary, if you took the Matthew at all, you probably heard this as well. They made claims that Matthew just decided to compile all these parables into one section of his gospel, particularly right here in what we have as chapter 13. May I say something to you, please? The Holy Spirit never does anything by accident. Never. Nor does he leave it to the literary whims of the authors of Scripture to do what they will with Scripture. God is the ultimate author of Scripture. Never forget that. Now the parables we're going to look at have more than one purpose to them. They're like a telescope. And they look through time at the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think of the Hubble scope there in space right now. It looks out into deep space and it sends back all of these beautiful hidden secrets that are there in space that you don't see on the surface when you go out, if you get away from the city, and you look up in the night sky. 
That was the marvelous thing of living in the mountains in South America, to get away from the city lights and look up at the night sky and not see a few hundred stars, but see tens of thousands of stars scattered all around. You remember looking at that, Cassie, when you were up there in the highlands in Peru? Remember seeing some of the spectacular? It looked like somebody splattered the sky with a paintbrush all across. It was so spectacular. Can I tell you something? The Word of God has some secrets in it that the Lord wants us to be able to look at. And these parables look forward through the ages of time and they prophetically reveal the great secrets of the kingdom. Now Jesus calls them in this passage of scripture, he calls them the mysteries of the kingdom in verse 11. That's what he described it at. They're hidden to some and they're revealed to others. The fact of the matter is there are about 21 mysteries of the kingdom revealed throughout the New Testament. We're only going to concentrate on the seven that are right here in Matthew 13 in these parables. Now, I want you to see something. I want you to look over at verse 52 in Matthew 13 because I want you to see and understand where I'm going with this and what the Lord said, where he went with what he placed in, in these verses here. Look in verse 52. It says, Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. That's what the Lord's going to do. Some of what we're going to look at over the next seven or eight weeks or so, the next couple of months, some of what we're going to look at are things that are very familiar to you. You say... You may say, though that's kind of old, I, what's new about that? Nothing. But some of what I'm going to share with you in the coming days will be new treasures perhaps for some of you. And you're going to be blessed by that and excited by that. I'm convinced of it. Well, let me begin by talking about the purpose of the parables because he spoke these parables and the disciples asked him in verse 10, why do you speak to them in parables? Remember this about parables. The meaning of a parable is this. This is, I don't know who said this, uh, but um, they called it an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's a pretty good description of it. The word parable in the Greek means to set alongside. And so what they're doing is, what the Lord is doing is setting a lesson alongside a story that illustrates it. He has a reason for that. He has a message that he wants to communicate as he does that. And the Lord wanted to highlight the truth for some, but he wanted to hold back the truth for others. And you think, well, that's cruel. I can't believe he'd want to do that. Look at verse 12, would you please? In Matthew 13, the Bible says this, Whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And he, the Lord, is, is sending a message that there that his time of investing in the nation of Israel was coming to a close. Now I want you to consider this as an illustration that somebody put forth. Think about a business, and we have some businessmen in here, and so you know what I'm speaking about, and, and you have two options in front of you. Both of them are going to cost you the same. Both of them, let's put a figure on that, are going to take an initial investment of $100,000, each one of them. It's not cheap to start a business, ladies and gentlemen, as a rule, although I know one or two businesses you can start for about $100, but you sure going to work a long time to make any money at it if you do that. 
Well, he invests $100, $100,000 in these two businesses this businessman does. One of them loses money almost immediately. The other one, on the other hand, after a couple of months, begins to make money. Which one is he going to invest in from that point on? The one that makes money, right? In fact, he'll take what he has, what's left of the $100,000 in the loser, and he'll shift it over to the one that's making money. That's what he'll do. And when we look at this, the Lord highlighted the truth for the disciples, but he held back the truth for those who refuse to be responsible for the truth that they already had. The Lord had a good motive in this. He did. As I alluded already, and as I referred to, Israel had reached a point where they completely ignored the truth that God set before them, ladies and gentlemen. Those words frighten me when I think about it. But the truth of the matter is this. Matthew 12 teaches us, in Matthew 12, that we reached a point where Israel now said, this guy does what he does by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of Satan. And they blasphemed the name of God, and God said, that's enough. I'm not dealing with this anymore. And he stopped at that point and began to speak in parables. By the way, in the book of Matthew, you will see fewer and fewer miracles from here on out. When you come up to 12, there are several miracles still being done. But now that they've reached the point where they disbelieve God, there are fewer miracles that you'll see in the rest of the book. The consequence is this. Jesus is beginning to hide the truth from those who refuse to believe the truth, and he did it through parables. I want you to grasp the impact of what I'm saying, because I believe that we today, in this age in the United States of America, are living what I'm saying right now. Listen to me. If you hear the truth and consistently ignore the truth, you will reach the point that you will miss out on the truth altogether. God will take away from you your ability to process the truth. And I'm seeing this repeatedly. In the past two days, in the Hattiesburg American, as they speak, spoke about the First Amendment protection bill that's up there before the governor now, the House Bill 1523 that's there before the governor. As they spoke about that and what's going on there, they came out with this article about how detrimental and dangerous this bill was for the rights of certain individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that bill does is protect our First Amendment rights so that no government can come in here and tell me that I will have to marry people that I don't believe should get married in this place. You all know exactly what I'm speaking about. Or do you need me to spell it out more clearly? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that's what it is for us today. And that's where we are. But you listen to the yahoos that they interviewed. Pseudo-preachers. False prophets. Amen. And they portrayed lies as truth because they can no longer understand the truth in this nation. Amen. Does that not frighten you? That frightens me. And I believe that's where we are today. And that's where Israel was. And God laid truth out in front of them repeatedly. 
and they completely ignored the truth. So very quickly, let me give you a panoramic view of the kingdom that's found in these parables in Matthew 13. And we're just going to walk through them very quickly uh, for a few moments' time. I want you to see these and understand what we have. The first principle that he's going to teach us that I'll come back next week and emphasize is this, that many will receive the word, but only some will believe the word. This is the very foundational parable that Jesus teaches us in this passage of Scripture. The sower and the seed. The seed is the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are the sowers of the seed. It's our responsibility to publish the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was over in the hospital this week more than one time, but in one of the instances that I was there, one of my good friends from Jones County, pastor of one of the churches there in Jones County, happened to come into the room and visit one of the people that I also went to see on that occasion. And um, nurse comes in, and she couldn't get out of the room before this man had shared the gospel with her on that, on that time. And he, everybody he sees, when he sees them, he stops and he shares the gospel with them. That's the kind of man that he is. It's an amazing thing to see, ladies and gentlemen, somebody who sows the seed as broadly as he sows the seed. It's an important thing. Well, I want you to know that he'll sow that seed, and I'll sow that seed, and you will too. And many will hear that, but only a few are going to believe it. Only a few are going to believe what God says in his word. We've seen this, all of us here. I've seen some completely ignore the word. I've seen others rejoice over the word, but turn away the first time one of their buddies laughs at them for believing the word. I've seen them accept the word and then let the cares of this world choke them out and choke the word in their hearts. I, I hear it all the time. It makes my heart twist. It makes my stomach churn when I hear people put the cares of this world in front of walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. It really breaks my heart. And then I've seen others receive the word and believe the word and apply the word and bear the fruit of the word. Billy Graham, ladies and gentlemen, Referring to this parable that we'll look at more in depth next week, he himself said that in any given church, only about 25% of its members are truly born again. May I ask you a question? Are you one of those 25%? Are you one of those who knows that you know, that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that if you died right now, you would spend eternity with him? Or are you one of those who just hopes that God will accept you because after all, you did a whole lot more good than you did bad in life? Don't frown over that, ladies and gentlemen. It's a frightening prospect. The second parable in this passage that the Lord Jesus teaches us that we're going to study in a couple of weeks, many are going to profess Christ, but only some are going to possess Christ. In verses 24 through 40, or through 30, excuse me, Jesus puts forth the parable of wheat and the tares. And the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. In the, first, in the first parable, the seed is the word of God. In this parable, you and I are the seed. 
when somebody else comes along and sows bad seed. Bad seed. You know, I hear folks time to time come to me and say to me, Preacher, I don't go to church. You know why? No? Tell me why. Well, they're hypocrites in the church. Do tell. <laughs> really? Hypocrites in the church. Can I tell you something? There have always been posers in the church. The devil has worked over time to infiltrate the, the church so that he can weaken it. He wants to dilute it. Did you know, I, 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 maybe some of you don't know this, I'm, I'm guessing most of us know this, but I want to be sure you know it. There was actually a time that it was popular to be a church member. But y'all know that. There was a time when everybody wanted to go to church. It was the social, hear what I said, it was the social thing to do. And if you didn't belong to a church, woe unto you. I know somebody that joined a local church, and when I said, why are you joining that particular church? He said, well, I just moved into the community, and that's what people in the community do here. They go to church, so I'm going to go to church as well. Be careful with that. Be careful with that. Watch out for that. There were people that would, in times past, even buy their church membership. They'd pull out their wallets, and they would bribe their way into church. Some even bought the position of leadership, some deacons, some preachers. And they paid for these things um, with their funds. Isn't that amazing? Now, I want you to know not everybody used their wallets to worm their way into church. Some used their words. They look good. They talk good. They do mighty deeds. But they look solid as an oak. <laughs> but they're as solid as a hollow tree. And that's all they are. Just a hollow tree. Look great on the outside. Empty on the inside. The next parable that Jesus mentions to us, he's going to teach us that there are false teachers in Jesus' name who will command a, a great following. And that's down here in verse 31. Another parable he put forth to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, this sounds like an expansive growth of the kingdom when you first read it. And if you do not keep this in the context of the parables of the kingdom where Jesus has taught it right here, you're going to be convinced it's a positive picture. In your heart, some of you are already thinking that very thing. But I want you to know that a closer study shows us that this is a mustard seed that becomes a tree and is not something satisfactory. Rather, it's something sinister that happens. And you see, some of those false believers of the wheat and the tares that we mentioned uh, just a moment ago now become false teachers, and they're like that mustard seed, and they grow up and become a mighty tree. And the birds of the air, why those have already been shown in the first parable, we haven't studied it yet, but they've already been shown to be the demons, the devil himself coming and working. So you see, the devil deceives and he attacks many through these very dangerous deceivers. Now verse 33 gives us a completely different parable, and that is 
the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid. You're going to want to circle that word hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. I can't wait <clears throat> to get to the point where I teach you the significance of three measures of meal. I think uh, for some of us that's going to blow us away when we hear it. So what begins with apparent commitment for some ends with absolute corruption. That's going to be the lesson of this particular parable in 33. Now, once again, so many of us read this parable and we think this is great. This is wonderful. Well, it's not wonderful. It's actually wicked. And the reason it is wicked is that leaven, ladies and gentlemen, is symbolic of sin in our lives. Throughout the Bible, yeast, leaven, symbolizes sin and evil. And Jesus even told the disciples, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. That's the sin of their self-righteous teaching. Some people see this right here as a change in society for the better. Can I tell you something? The church is not changing society. It's the other way around. Society's changing the church. That's what's happening to us. And if you believe that things are getting better, you're buying a pack of lies from the world. <laughs> you might think right now, why don't you just lead us in a word of depression? I mean, everything I've said is negative, isn't it? Negative, negative, negative. I understand that. <clears throat> Hand me that water, brother. I fully understand that. Negative, negative, negative. You want to stand there and just be my holder for a minute? Okay. He didn't believe me. Go ahead. Yeah, give him a round. <laughs> Go ahead. Verse 44, ladies and gentlemen. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You see... When we come to that parable, we're going to learn that you and I are the hidden treasure. <laughs> and God paid the ultimate price to purchase us. The price of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was hidden. It was hidden. The Bible teaches us in, in Matthew 13 and verse 17 that these things were hidden from even the prophets. It was hidden. The kingdom of God was hidden. But God allows us now to see it. He uncovers it for you and for me. Christ came to uncover the hidden kingdom. And then later, he tells us, I'm about to wrap it up. Give me just a couple seconds. What holds no value to some was greatly valued by the king of kings. Look at verse 45. This is the parable of the pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Do you know who you are? You're the pearl of great price. You're the pearl that the Lord Jesus Christ purchased. That's the magnificent love that Christ Jesus has for you. And there's one more parable that we'll discuss before this is over. Verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind 
which when it was full, they drew it to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You see... The judgment that man tries so hard to escape. Listen to me. The judgment that man tries so hard to escape is imminent and is inescapable. The time is coming very soon when we shall behold him. Y'all didn't know I was going to even be preaching this this morning. Very soon. We shall behold him. And you know what? When Jesus finally steps on this earth, he's going to gather men together. And it's going to be judgment day, ladies and gentlemen. And great men, and insignificant men, and rich men, and poor men, and powerful women, and pretty women, and ugly and unpleasant women and men along with those who are easy on the eyes, are all going to stand in front of the great judge and they're going to tremble. They're going to plead. They're going to beg. They're going to grovel. They're going to weep as they ask for mercy. But when that time comes, there will be two words spoken. No mercy, no mercy. You can have mercy now. You can find forgiveness now. But when the dragnet of God's judgment comes, when those angels obey the command of the Lord, your opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, is gone forever. So tell me who you are today. Are you the ground that received the word of God and produces good fruit? Are you the wheat or are you the tares? Are you the good bread or are you the bread full of the leaven of sin? Are you truly, truly, Truly born again by the blood of Jesus? Have you come to that place where you know that Jesus is your Lord? You may say to me, I prayed with the preacher, so yes. You may say, Sure, I was baptized. You may even say, I joined the church, so yes. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Joining the elk club doesn't make you an elk, and joining the moose club won't make you a moose, and joining the church doesn't make you a Christian. You have to have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to, by an act of your own will, receive him into your life. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what I'm asking you. Have you come to that place today? Is that who you are today? Where you can point back at a stake in the ground and say, that's where... I became a child of God right there. Father, I want you to take this invitation time and use it for your glory. And speak to our hearts today, please, Lord. Teach us today, dear Lord. Make this your moment. There are some present who need to repent and believe the gospel. I can't save you and my words can't save you. 
but you can turn to the Lord and you can ask the Lord today and you can speak with the Lord and you can say Lord Jesus I need you to come into my life today listen to me you can tell him Lord Jesus I need you to come into my life I'm a sinner and I'm going to face judgment day but I believe you died for my sin and I believe that you want to save me so speak to me Lord Jesus come into my life today change my life Lord Jesus come into my heart I'm asking you in Jesus name 